This is an eight and a half foot long skull of a rice's whale. And it's just one part of the entire whale skeleton housed in the Smithsonian's collection. This is the first left, left rib. And um, in here, we have the scapula from this animal, which is the shoulder blade. But none of these bones are on display. Instead, they're stashed in a warehouse large enough to fit a 747, alongside millions of other bones. So why is this all hidden away? And what actually happens behind the scenes? To see the work in action, we met up with John. So right now we have over 18,000 specimens. John's specialty is mammals, specifically marine mammals at the Smithsonian. These are fin whales, and then we have humpbacks. So he knows this collection inside and out. Over here on this side, we have the vertebral column of the blue whale that went to the 1904 World's Fair. So this animal was 80 feet long. The Smithsonian collected most of its large whales from whaling stations in the 1800s and early 1900s. But today, it works with research and government agencies to preserve specimens that died from accidental causes, like eating plastics, getting entangled in fishing gear, or being struck by ships. Take this Rice's whale skull. This one had been entangled in fishing gear, and you can see there's rope scars here, where the rope dug into its palate. And this caused the animal to starve and become emaciated and beach. This species was discovered in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's critically endangered. There's only 30 or fewer left, and I fear it's going to go extinct. The whales are so rare, the museum was only able to find a full adult specimen to study in 2019. It was found beached in the Everglades, and the original plan was to take some samples and then throw the carcass back to the ocean. But John lobbied hard to preserve every single bone of the whale and add it to the Smithsonian's collection, despite the effort and cost. I got really hyper about it. I thought there was just no way they could do that because this is an extremely rare whale. So I was right on top of Noah, begging, pleading, whining, you name it. Recovering and preserving the entire specimen took nearly a year. The Smithsonian had to first move it to Fort De Soto Park to decompose in this pit of sand and ammonia. That took six months. Then onwards to the Bonehenge Whale Center in Beaufort, North Carolina to compost. That was another five months. And then it finally arrived at the Smithsonian Support Center in Maryland, where it started its last stage of cleaning, maceration. For months, water gradually dissolved the soft tissues and removed any grease. This tank is currently full of uh, vertebrae, which is basically like your spine. These whale bones have been out here for about five months, and only now are they ready for their final clean. It's mostly done over the summer months with the heat and humidity and good bacteria cultures. Periodically, we'll just top up the water and do water changes, sometimes 50%, sometimes more. A whole whale can take over a year to be fully cleaned, before going through an ammonia soak to strip it of any lingering oils. So preparators found a way to speed things up for smaller specimens. Those are housed next door, in the second warehouse dedicated to marine animals. Okay guys, you are being invaded by the video crew. <laughs> Here you'll find the skulls of beaked whales, narwhal tusks, and dolphin heads. Would you like to see something really cool? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because I want to show you right now my favorite specimen. Marine mammals are weird to start off with, and this might be the weirdest one. So this is the skull of the pygmy sperm whale. This is the left nostril. This here is the right nostril. I love this. <laughs> it's just so weird looking. To get these guys ready for museum preservation, the staff get some helping hands, or mouths, thanks to the Smithsonian's army of flesh-eating beetles. 
Sorry about the spiders, they are in here too. The museum has thousands of dermistid beetles, which it releases into temperature-controlled chambers to munch on tissues and muscles. They're not harmful to humans. They're helpful. They can get in very small nooks and crannies that we otherwise can't reach easily. They're kind of our unsung heroes. If you look closely, you'll see cheesecloth between the bins, so the bugs can easily migrate from one specimen to another, kind of like a highway. We have a flyer. If it gets warm enough, they can uh, develop wings and fly around like this little guy here. The beetles might get a few coworkers if the animals are even larger. These are compost bins, where tissues are consumed by beetles, worms, cockroaches, and other naturally occurring pests. Here's the top of his head, his eyes were back here, and then here's his jaw. It can take anywhere from a few weeks to a month for the beetles to do their job. Faster if they're hungry and even faster if the animals are small. When the bugs move on to their next meal, it's a sign that these bones are ready to go. If they do a good job, sometimes we'll just kind of refer to one and just say good job or like good job team, just a little running joke. Good job, good job, good job. So thanks guys for <laughs> all of your good work. <laughs> Only after every ligament is nibbled away and every drop of grease stripped with ammonia can these bones dry off and finally join the collection? But even then, this isn't for the public. This is for science. This is a research team in action. This group from the Calvert Marine Museum is primarily interested in the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin and how its skull has changed over time. The key here is looking at specimen after specimen. It's taken the Smithsonian over 150 years to build up its collection of more than 2,000 bottlenose dolphins. And as for our Rice's whale, it took nearly three years for the team to mount the skull, thanks in part to the COVID-19 pandemic. You caught us right in the middle of sort of the final processing of getting this into the collection. Now that the entire specimen is properly preserved, researchers can finally learn more about this rice's whale and what happened in its life. Currently, pathologists are working to find the cause of these fractures and bruises. This is the first left, left rib. And what you can see here is that it was cracked pretty badly and uh, now it's rehealing. And uh, in here, we have the scapula, so what we have here is this V-shaped crack and some, and some bruising. They plan to do CT scans to look at the bone at a microscopic level. And their findings will help the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration create guidelines for preventing more harm to the species. This is America's whale, and it is about to go away. And I think Americans should realize that. We have a grand beautiful whale that is only living in American waters and it's going extinct. And we should be raising the alarm bells about that. We should be saying, hey, how do we save this? But saving the rice's whale can only come from studying specimen after specimen, which is why the Smithsonian's collection is so necessary. And what happens to the rice's whale might also affect the lives of all the other living creatures in its orbit. We are documenting the biodiversity of the planet, and this is hugely important. It's a top predator in its system. You know, who knows if this animal disappears, what happens to the ecosystem? <laughs>